Hi, this is Ian from Pro Detailer Magazine. Uh, we're on the last leg of our German exodus. We've travelled all the way through Germany visiting different companies and for our last stop we've come around about 30 kilometres south of Stuttgart to Steinheim. Uh, we're here with Flex, who I'm sure you'll know produce a wide range of power tools um, with some very important polishers uh, in the detailing industry. I'm sitting here with Gert Moller. Uh, Gert, would you like to tell us who you are in Flex and what you do here? Hi, I'm Gerd, Gerd Möller uh, with Flex. I'm responsible for the export business of Flex and uh, building our international markets. Okay. So can you tell us a bit about Flex, the company itself? How, how did Flex start? Good question. Um, Flex was founded in 1922 by two German engineers. Their first uh, invention was an electric motor with a flexible shaft. Mm -hmm which was um, the foundation, if you will, uh, for the name of Flex. Okay. Later on, with the development of the first angle grinder, Flexen became more and more synonymous um, for angle grinding. And uh, today, nowadays, if you uh, go into a shop, uh, ask for an angle grinder, if you say, I need a Flex, everybody knows what you are asking for. Okay, That's so similar the in the UK, how we have um, Hoover for describing a vacuum cleaner exactly. or sellotape for sticking back plastic. That's it. Okay, so it's a very, it's a very famous in Germany as a brand, isn't it? It's, it's got its. What, what's the what's the reputation as it were in Germany? How do you how does Flex appeal to the German people? Flex um, stands for quality, I would say, and for solutions to the point. Uh, we Flex uh, was developing. Um, high quality tools in very close dialogue with the craftsmen. So craftsmen turned to Flex and said we need a different switch here or we, we need a, 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 another functionality and how can we solve it. In, in that way um, the tools were developed and uh, on that high quality level customers all, always were satisfied with the outcome and with their solution. And um, this built the reputation. And today, if a craftsman is asking for flex, he does that for the durability, the high quality, and uh, the functionality of the tool. Um, your markets, what, what sort of markets are you, are you catering for at the moment, would you, would you say? Mostly flex, is a, uh, as a specialist, is catering to four uh, major fields of application, which is building renovation, which is metal, which is automotive detailing mm -hmm. and stoneworking. And uh, we are distributed in 90 countries in the world, some of them with own subsidiaries and some of them with importing partners. And the idea is always to support the craftsmen locally with the best tool um, to make them accomplish their uh, piece of work in a, a professional way. The reputation is growing around the world, and what's the uh, what's the reason for the, your successful development worldwide? Would you say? I would say in providing the perfect solution for that piece of work, the craftsman is actually um, uh, looking into, and uh, that's um, the technicity, the technical solution that is behind. Flex is a specialist in um, in the gear. Uh, creating gearboxes to provide the right torque with, uh, in the right uh, speed range and to, to make the, um, the tool work properly in that uh, range that the craftsmen uh, desire. All right, looking over here, we've got one of the latest creations. We've got the, uh, the new cordless range. Um, where, where's the, the drive for the new cordless come from? As well? How why, why is cordless the next big thing and why are you pushing it so much, would mm. you say? I guess the future is cordless. Uh, more and more cord, um, power tools um, um, come without a cord because it uh, gives the freedom uh, to the craftsman. You don't have to take care of the cord. And uh, Flex with an own battery platform and own technology is now able to provide the same a high quality tool with a, a functionality uh, I described earlier, um, either with cord or uh, with battery, and that's the uh, main reason for growth at the moment. Gert, thank you very much for talking to us. Uh, we're going to be going on a tour of the factory with you later on, so we'll, we'll catch up later. 
Hello there. Following on from uh, Ian's interview with Gert, I've managed to corner Martin Zeitler, uh, who is the essentially the product guru. He's got a very formal term, which is what's your official title within Flex? Um, I'm uh, the product manager for the polishing tools. Um, with the main, main focus on the, the coded, coded surfaces. And I'm also the product manager for um, all the stone machines that we have in our program, so stone cutting and grinding machines. Gotcha. Well, Martin has very kindly pulled all of his toys, or, or at least some of the, the detailing toys, out of his special toy box. And we have a great range of products here. And what I thought would be really nice would be to talk through the evolution of the products, yeah. um, from the stuff that you used when you were young, um, to right up to the more modern ones, <laughs> yeah. and um, I'm joking, of course, this is, this is much older. Um, and uh, just really kind of see the evolution, but also hit on what the current range is, because you've actually got quite a lot of machines, yeah. um, particularly now we've got the battery-powered ones, um, and that brings a whole new dimension to the machines. But let's start with the granddaddy. Um, what, God, this is, this is properly heavy. Do you know how much this weighs? It must be about three, four, five kilos? Uh, three kilograms. Three yeah. kilograms. And you can tell wool mitt in those days, they're only polished with wool? Yeah. And in the past, they only work with uh, wool pads. They don't have sponge at mm -hmm. that time. so Because it wasn't invented, I guess. Yeah. Yes. And bear in mind that the foam pads, the, the sponge pads that we use, are they're synthetic. Um, although, of course, they had natural sponge in those days, but yeah. they didn't have the foam. We are going to talk about pad technology because we've uh, gone through quite an interesting presentation earlier this morning um, about the different types of foam and how it's made. Yeah. Uh, and I, for one, was learning an awful lot. So I think it's something that uh, our watchers might quite enjoy. Um, and of course, this would not be working on the lacquered paint that we have nowadays because it's different, isn't it? How was the paint in those days? Um, the difference is um, we have here a, a fixed fixed um, speed range. Mm -hmm. So we have not a speed range, we have a fixed speed. Yeah, it's just with on a, or off. Is yeah, the that's yeah. right. And um, it's around about 1,600 RPM. And Which is I think the same as this. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's the same like, like uh, now. Um, but I think in a high professional tool that, that end users use now, they need a variable speed, yes. a low low uh, starting speed, and a big start and a, a big speed range. That's true. Because yeah. in the old days, of course, the, the paint was uh, well uh, in that sort of time being nitrocellulose most of the time, which was mm -hmm. I believe invented by Dupont in 1923. Something yeah, like that. Yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely sure of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for Google. Um, and um, so the paint they were dealing with is different. And you were saying also that they have a, there was a varnish essentially over the paint, and so a lot of it was refinishing that varnish. And because when cars went into mass production. Um, obviously, we're talking post Model T, Ford, and all the rest of it. Um, the varnish was applied very kind of yeah. hapdash, I think might be a good word, um, although I'm going to confuse your dictionary <laughs> also there. Um, and as a result, it was all about refining that back into uh, as nice a gloss as you can get. But bear in mind, they didn't have paint depth gauges. They didn't have any of the technology that we have. Um, I mean, in my, in my kind of mind's eye, I'm seeing doing it by candlelight, but I suppose they did have, <laughs> they did have the sun. Um, but it's just, it's, it's nice to see the evolution, even where the handle is, and I'm guessing I wouldn't put my hand there to come It doesn't work. It. it doesn't work. <laughs> it gets a bit sparky. Um, and a wooden handle. Absolute brilliant piece of kit. Um, and you feel that this will last. Um, you feel you could use this for a long time um, and it'd be pretty, pretty tough, which is handy because that's pretty much the, you know, one of the core values of Flex is quality of machine. Um, and as the market gets ever busier and busier, you know, you've got to stand out and German manufacturing, German quality. Um, that's what, you know, a core value of Flex is. Um, so what I want to do is we've got two other machines from the past. Um, what's what's this thing here? It's it's got lots of labels on it's it. It's a <laughs> it's a PE and uh, not a PE. Yeah, it's a L fifteen oh three VR, and it's the first small polisher that we bring on the market. Um, it's we bring that tool in ninety ninety eighty five or ninety eighty seven on the market. So 1985, same vintage as me. So this is a 30-year-old polisher, either yeah. way you look at it. But we have that um, in our program, yeah. Hmm? It's yeah. been produced, yeah. yeah. And I, I do, I love the fonts on the side. It's, <laughs> it's a sort of ode back to the to the early 90s. And again, you can still see the colour is yeah. interesting. And inter when we uh, wandered around the factory and stuff, we noticed that the uh, colour, the machines going to North America, are a slightly different colour. 
Yeah, from the other machines, which is fascinating. Nice little detail. Um, but this, yeah, you can see the origins and the evolution of this on there. Um, what were the, I mean, what machine replaced this that's in your current arsenal? I'm guessing it's going to be that one there. Yeah, the, the, the newest or the next generation of the L1503 is the P, um, P84 and uh, or the PE1403. Gotcha. That we can see in the backside. Um, that's uh, the next the next yeah. next generation of of that um, tool. Brilliant. Well, again, so these are this is this is the daddy and and this is the the, the, the child. And you can see, you know, the various things have moved. So you've you've got your lock buttons moved. You've got a curved um, thing, which is more yeah. ergonomic, I think, is yeah, the phrase. Yeah. And of course, in the eighties, everything was very kind of eight bit, yeah. wasn't it? So people's hands were squarer. Um, and also, I've noticed the switch has moved. Yeah. Um, was that, again, this brings us back really to product development, isn't it? Did people say, I want the switch here, or did you just fancy a change? Um, we used that um, base motor from that polisher for uh, other tools. So we, we must um, have that positioning not f directly for the, the polishing um, tool. So it's a, it's a base machine. So. I see what you mean. So yeah. it's, it's more to do with the kind of the characteristics of it, yeah. I suppose. And, and I've just noticed other things. It is a lot lighter. You can see how technology has come on. This is a chunky monkey. This one is, is pretty mobile. Yeah. Um, so it's quite nice to see this development of, of products going on. And as I say, we've been all around the factory and the manufacturing. And some of the processes that we're seeing uh, are absolutely fascinating. And it's a combination of CAD CAM automated CNC machines uh, with lots of squirty of lubricants and robot arms. It's absolutely freaking awesome. Um, and then at the same time, you go to the assembly line and you've got hundreds of people um, putting things together and, and doing sort of things terribly well organized, as we said. Uh, I'm not entirely surprised at that. Um, so we'll move on to the next one here. Tell me, this product looks kind of the same sort of vintage as this one. Yeah. Um, so we're getting kind of 80s, 90s sort of machine. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's something a bit different though. Although it's about the same sort of size, it's a fair bit heavier. Yeah. Um, what sort of machine is it? It's a XP 1107, mm -hmm. and it's a special random orbital polisher with a free spinning. Free spinning. And, yeah. and what what size is the orbit? 8.8 uh, millimeters. 8.8 .8 millimeters. 8.8 .8 millimeters. Because nine millimeters was just a little bit too much. So <laughs> yeah. 8 .8, and it's not 8.81 millimeters. No, no, no. 8.8 no, no, millimeters. Good, good. We've been having fun all day with this. Um, this particular machine um, is, uh, how long was this on sale for? Uh, only for two years on the market. So it's quite a rare, quite a rare item. This. Yeah. It's a, probably a collector's item in times to come, I suspect. Um, and how come it was on the market for so little time? It's um, too hard of the, the market mm -hmm. um, in, that, in that... It just wasn't ready for it. No, no. That's the thing, is that actually large, uh, well, this isn't technically a large throw DA, but it's, it's, a, it's a reasonable length DA. It's an 8.8 millimeter oscillation. Um, but the, the market, there was not much else out there. Was there a, I mean, can you think of another product back in those days that was the same, or is this totally unique at the time? Um, I think it's at the time, yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing is that quite often with technological developments and not just in detailing, a product is so insightful, so different, so, so new that uh, the market itself is unwilling to make that kind of mental leap to adopt it. I, I think in the, in the past, um, all the detailers only want to work with a rotary polisher. That's true. Well, to yeah. be fair, there are some antique detailers now who are still only want to and, work with a rotary polisher. And I think... Um, the compound that they have in that time, yes, it doesn't work with a random orbital polisher. No, absolutely, and that's that's the other thing is that with the random orbital stuff, um, and in fact possibly with the forced rotation, is that the there are systems that are built up around it. I mean, yeah. you, yourself have got a pad, uh, pad and machine system. Rupes have equally got systems as well. Yeah, yeah. It is it's the new way of doing things, and it's and it, there's there's good reason behind it. It's not just uh, commercial. It's not just like well we've sold them a machine, so let's say we can sell them some liquids and sell them some powder and great. Um, um, what actually is, is because in terms of weighting with a DA, bear in mind that that's hurling around with a counterweight, um, is that if the pad, the pad needs to weigh a certain amount, and if it's too heavy, it'll put it out of balance, and if it's too light, it'll put yep. it out of balance. Yep. Um, but enough about pads for now. We've got some exciting stuff coming up on pads. Um, I've had uh, a, an interesting t talk with Martin, who's a fountain of knowledge on this sort of topic. Um, but uh, we are now getting into uh, mod machines, aren't we? Yeah. 
So this is the current one. Now, before we pursue into that, I, I need you to explain the nomenclature, and that's going to confuse you. <laughs> Basically, um, uh, you can name machines with, with serial numbers or with model numbers or, 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 or with names that people remember. Um, and I just want to know, is there any logic, and I'm guessing there is logic, otherwise I wouldn't be asking this question, um, behind the nomenclature, as in the naming system, yeah. um, of the different uh, flex polisher range at the moment? Yeah. All the new tools um, have um, a special nomenclature. Mm -hmm. And um, so all our rotary polisher that we have uh, starts with a PE. So PE, PE in flex terms means rotary. Yeah. And the P is for polishing, and that it means rotary. And that E um, is for um, variable speed. Okay. Yeah. That works. So, okay, so P and E, and I'm guessing those mean they're, they're referred to words in German, I'm guessing. Yeah. Let's, let's just for the, for the fun of it. What do they stand for in, in German? Uh, P, E. Okay. But the long versions of them. <laughs> <laughs> Polita Electronica or something like that? I don't know. Uh, no, it's a polisher. It's a polierer. Mm -hmm. And um, electronic is it's electronic. electronic. Yeah. I'm learning it's so like much German. <laughs> at the moment. It's brilliant. Um, the um, okay, so let's let's kick off with this one. Now this looks to, well. Actually, tell me what this is, just so I don't embarrass myself again. So that's a uh, um, XFE seven twelve. Okay, it's so XFEs are XFE. so we've done the PEs are, are rotaries. XFEs are uh, free spinning mm, or DA dual action. No. Um, the X is standing for eccentrical polisher. Gotcha. So, and the F. So it's eccentric. It has some strange hobbies yeah. and stuff. Yeah. And the F is for sp free spinning. Okay. So the X F E. Variable you speed. You learn <sighs> variable speed. Um, Brilliant. This. Yeah. Yeah, it's, so XFE, and, and the first XFE was a big one. We tested in the mega test, and we, yeah. we got, um, and again, you can read about that in, in EP issue five, and we had a quite an early developed, well, kind of a, an early model, and then we got some other ones later on, and ultimately, the one that we got at the end was taken by Ian, the, the features editor, and used at Goodwood on some very sexy cars, Ooh. and he came back with a big smile on his face. Um, so, I mean, that was partly due to, due to Ian, but uh, apart from that, it was, um, you know, it was, it was light sort of thing, um, and it was going up against some pretty tough competition as well. Um, but this XFE, so this is, this, is, this is a little bit smaller than the other it's one. It's a small one, yeah. What's the uh, oscillation on this? What's the throw? 12 millimeter. 12 millimeter. Yeah. And the bigger XFE is? 15 millimeters. 15 millimeter. Um, and have they got the same power or? No, it's um, only 700 um, watt. Mm -hmm. And uh, the big one, um, I don't know, it's only the same, nearly the same power. Okay. So um, different designs, nearly the same power. Both of them had 700 watt. Gotcha. Um, only our XC mm -hmm. um, has a 900 watt. 900, gotcha. Yeah. We will get onto that later. Yeah. Um, and so uh, this one is, is, as I say, I haven't actually seen this one being used or anything like that, but I imagine if it's anything like the, the current XFE, it will impress. Um, and then what have we got here? We've got a little rotary by the looks of it. Yeah, that's a P84. Okay, and, and the eight and four, what do they stand for? Um, eight is um, the watt. The, the power of the machine. For 800, I guess. I yeah. Eight watts, yes. And the four is the maximum speed range. So uh, it's until 4,000 RPM. Oh, wow. OK. Yeah. So that's cool. Um, and then, and again, these are small machines. And noticeably, if you look at comparable machines, again, the weight is big difference. The ergonomics is different. And also, you're kind of slightly less 1985 there with a the, with the graphic, <laughs> which is nice. Um, we are now onto this monstrous beast. Um, tell me about this machine. That's the P142. Mm -hmm. That's a benchmark machine of um, the rotary polishers on the market. I was market. about to say, I've seen more of these than I have of just about any other one. Every time we yeah. go to a, a, a detailer's unit or something like that, um, if they've got a rotary, um, chances are, I mean, it's obviously you could have a Festool, you could have a Rupes and stuff, but the, but the Flex rotary is the, the perhaps, arguably, he might beat me for this, but I'd say the strongest, so far, the strongest product in the yeah. range, the most commonly used one. Um, and again, great piece of kit. And this is, you were saying, how many watts? 1,400 watts on this one? Yeah. So it's a, it's a potent beast. And for those who, who are diehard rotaryists, um, it's, it's certainly a favorite there. Um, and this takes us on to the big brother of this one. This is the XFE? XFE, yeah. Um, so this is the one that we did in the mega test. Um, and again, it's a, it's a nice piece of kit. And the idea of this, this is a, a 15 mil throw. Yep. Um, so this is going up against the Roops uh, LHR15E. Uh, 
Um, and it's uh, you've been quite late to market with with these longer throws. That's right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's interesting, and it goes up to some serious speed as well. There's nine thousand. Um, I suppose that's. Uh, Oscillations per minute rather than rotations yeah. per minute, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but 9,000, that's you know Honda VTEC territory. Um, yeah. And um, then what's that machine there then? That's our XC. Is uh, We call it a, a dual action polisher. So it's also an eccentrical tool, mm -hmm. but um, you can give a pressure on it and it works straight. Mm -hmm. Well, this is this is what we call, or is often referred to colloquially, as the VRG. Yeah. Um, and it's also kind of colloquially known as a, as a forced rotation device. Um, it's what they call it. Obviously, you know, it's it's the XE in, in official lands. What does XE? We know what E now stands for. We've had practice at that. But yeah. X. The X um, X is eccentric. Eccentric. And the C is for that special positive um, or forced. The kind of direct drive, forced yeah, rotation. Forced rotation or dual action, however, and... Because this product, again, with Flex, when, when anybody says Flex, um, the VRG always comes on topic, and the VRG, you could argue, has the benefits of a rotary and the benefits of a, of a DA. That's right. And um, although I've heard mumblings that a, a force drive system was developed not for detailing, but back in the 90s from, from another company for, I think it was for sanding or something like that. But in terms of the detailing, if this came out 2006, 2007? Yeah, that's right, 2006. And it was um, the only one, and it has been the only one, for at least 10 years. Um, yeah. And now it's coming up 12 years old. Um, and um, only now has Rupes jumped on the bandwagon with a melee. And but not with this high stroke than, than we have. That is true. Yeah. That is true. The one thing we're talking around, and we've talked to quite a few engineers and technicians and, and clever boffins, um, and they say, you know, I was talking here about the importance of quality. They get really excited about gearboxes. And I mean, really quite excited about gearboxes. So I'll give you a little insight, is that when a, a machine is on the construction line, uh, you've obviously got a crown wheel and it, it turns your drive by 90 degrees. So you've got the motor, if I may grab your, your doodah. Yeah. Uh, you've got the motor in here and that's putting drive into that direction. And so this crown wheel that's giving that 90 degree turn uh, are two cogs, as you'd imagine, working together. Um, and to make sure they work well, these guys run them in. So they'll take the cogs before they've been anywhere near the rest of the machine and they'll put them in uh, a device. We've got some VT to, to roll over this so you don't have to look at my face, which is always nice. Um, and it will make sure, and it's with very, very fine grit, isn't it? Yeah. Um, to make sure that not only are those wheels kind of worked in like you would wear, work in an engine on a car, but they're worked in specifically to each other. So once those two cogs have gone into that machine, they're there for life. Yeah. Um, and then furthermore, once the machine is all constructed, and again, we've got some more footage of this, um, the machines are, um, they're not only sort of just quickly tested, they work, they're put into a whole cabinet. Um, you've got 110 and 240 volts, so even, even the Americans who can't be trusted with 240 yeah. volts um, are um, given a separate machine to run. And they're put in there for 30, 40 minutes by the looks of things, just to um, take over? No, it's uh, only 10 minutes. Okay. Um, to check vibrations or gear noise or... Gotcha. That so, yeah. so that's for really for manufacturing defaults. But the, yeah. there are so many companies now that will just put something straight into a box, um, you know, without even turning it on. And you guys, you know, each machine has been touched by each of you and, and yeah. checked and all the rest of yeah. it. And yeah. there is a lot of diligence. Diligence, I think, is the word that I would use to describe yeah, yeah, the manufacturing definitely. process. That's flex. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way forward. So we're nearly through. And this brings us on to uh, your latest and greatest development. Now, we're, we're going to touch on, on future developments later on. Um, and we have actually already done a little video. If you look back on the YouTube channel, you'll find uh, Ian and myself um, had uh, some boxes from, from Flex and we opened them up and, and played with the tools inside, one of which is this battery powered. Uh, and now this is the rotary? The PE. P, here we go again, right, okay. <laughs> PE, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, it's the rotary polisher. Okay. With variable speed. So that's PE. PE. Okay, and how do you signify that it's powered by batteries? Oh, uh, it's only the PE 150. Okay. It's the name for the machine. So PE for rotary 150 for the maximum size of the backing blade. Okay. And that's all. That's all? Yeah. It's totally inconsistent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They've just done it to confuse us. Um, and this machine is, is pretty seminal, really. Uh, Flex, you guys have got access to some pretty cool battery technology. 
um, and you've been putting that to good use. And not just on these tools, bear in mind. There's, there's, as you can see, many tools behind me. And in this room, there are, there are people looking at me, but also there are machines looking at me and tempting me. And um, they all, well, not all of them, but a lot of them are running off the same sort of battery tech yeah. as this. Um, and we're getting to a situation now where you can run a battery uh, in a machine like this. And bear in mind, if um, it says about 30, 35 minutes. Um, if you uh, rotary around about uh, 30, yeah, 30, 30 minutes. 35 minutes. and. And, uh, and free spinning is around about 40 minutes. 40 minutes. And, yeah. and the point that was made is, uh, you know, when we put the video up initially, a lot of people were saying, oh, I prefer my cords and all the rest of it. And we've actually done an interview with a, with a detailer as well in support of the battery concept, which I think is infinitely practical. Um, but the point which I found really interesting is you're saying, well, okay, if you're saying you're doing, a, 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 say, a 30-minute a set polishing, mm -hmm. only 70% of that time is the machine working. Because the rest of the time, you're squirting your compound onto your ding-dong, you're checking, you're wiping, you're having a look around. Yep. Um, and so actually, you can run this battery start to finish, and by the time you've finished, another battery's charged up, ready to rumble. Yep. Um, and equally, there's nothing stopping you getting more batteries. Um, when we were having this debate before, before the interview, um, it was suggested that we should buy 20 batteries, um, <laughs> which I think was a, a little bit ambitious, but that was a salesman rather than a technical person. <laughs> so um, we um, have looked through all the current machines. Uh, I'm just looking at my little notes here, and I would really like to talk about pads in detail. Okay. Are you up for, for a bit of pad action? Brilliant. Um, so you were describing earlier about um, how the foam pads particularly are made. Do you want to uh, enlighten us? Yeah. Um, a typical or it gives only maybe around uh, five or six companies in the world who produce sponge blocks. Mm -hmm. The so raw material. When we say sponge, just, just always intersect that with foam, because sponge, sponge to us is like sort of usually natural stuff that you wipe over a car. Okay. I, I know okay. that's similar, foam. but foam. Good. Um, so it gives only that, that producer. So um, everyone who needs a foam um, buys at that companies. So that we're talking about companies that manufacture the raw product, so yeah. to speak, and then yeah. you buy that to, to make your own devices, because of course it's not just polishing pads that are made no, out no, of foam. No, no, no. It's a raw material. Yeah. So, and um, to make a, a forming block, mm -hmm. it's a chemical process. It is. You, and sort of, you sort of grow them, don't you, in, in a big kind of a mixture and it, it propagates out. Yeah. It's like a baking bread mm -hmm. in a form and a lot of chemicals inside, and you can't control that. Um, the consistency, the kind of yeah. how homogeneous it is. We were discussing long words. I've just been essentially confusing Martin for quite a time with, with unnecessarily long words. But the, the texture, if you imagine baking bread, which is a great yeah. analogy, is that um, when you're baking bread and you cut it open and you see the texture of all the flour and all the stuff that's kind of done its thingamajiggles and the seeds and stuff, it's pretty random. Yeah. It's not consistent. Um, and it's the same deal when, you, when you're doing a big block. And bear in mind, we are talking big blocks. We're going to try and steal some photos and put them on so people can see what we mean. But big, mm -hmm. big blocks of foam. And um, equally, like, and, and I don't know quite how, how good this analogy is, but there are good bits and bad bits. So the best bit of the foam is in the middle of the foam. Yeah, the fillet. The fillet. The yeah. fillet, so to speak, comparing it to, you know, cutting animals up and stuff. So we've got to browse over that one quite quickly. Um, but the uh, foam itself, the best bit's in the middle, and then it gets worse as it goes out. Yeah. So uh, for the kind of A-grade clients, so people like yourself, you'll be taking right we just want the little tiny bit in the middle the fillet yeah. um, and then the kind of the anonymous stuff the unbranded stuff you might buy online and suspiciously cheap um, a lot of the, the the deficit in quality is going to be the fact that it's taken from the outer edge which of course is cheaper for them to buy in the first place yeah. um, and then this foam you, you were explaining about um, the shape of the edge of the foam pad so imagine you've got a foam pad we really ought to have had a foam pad here to do some propage um, I'm going to glare at somebody to try and get me a foam pad um, it's, it's not working and um, you were talking about the edge. So with a conventional uh, flex foam pad, it's a kind of it's a curved edge like that, yeah. isn't it? Um, so tell us about the, the, the de development you made. Yeah. Uh, in the past, we have uh, forming pads where you can't see where you work. But it's not a problem if you work with a rotary. But uh, now we have uh, a lot of um, eccentrical machines on the market. So we, you must see where you work. Mm -hmm. So... We need a new form of a polishing pad where you can see the end of the pad. So you can see also the working area where you um, work with the... Working the paint. Um, yeah. So this is, this is the new? This is new the, design. the new form, yeah. So you'll notice if you look at other pads, specifically for DAs, you've got kind of quite a steep angle here um, and it spreads out. And the problem is, and you've got a funky little diagram to show us, 
<coughs> excuse me, um, and basically you can't put the pressure equally over the edge. That's right. Um, and so it becomes inconsistent. Um, whereas this design, you can put pretty equal pressure. You've actually got two different textures of foam, so I can feel it's much yep. stiffer at the top. Um, and that allows you, uh, you can see where you're working, but you don't have the disadvantage of a heavy taper. Um, and then you're also talking about the depth of pad. Tell us how the depth of the pad affects it. Yeah. Um, it's, um, if, you, if you work with uh, <coughs> different, different kinds of um, drive types for mm -hmm. polisher, you need or you must have one size. So you can use your pads for all the different drive types. That's the best way that, that you can have. But um, a problem is <coughs> if you use a um, um, random orbital polisher with mm -hmm. a high stroke, um, more than 10, 12 millimeters, you have a big problem with the heating inside of the sponge. So about that um, throg that you have, you get a, a wobbling inside, mm -hmm. and then you get uh, inside the, the foam pad um, temperature until 160 degrees. And of course 160 degrees is not very good for that foam. Yeah, and the problem is um, users don't see it. But so you can't see it on the on the surface where you work, and you can't see it on the backside mm -hmm. where the um, velcro Back is. Yeah. So it's only in the middle of the foam pad. So the pad destroyed inside melts inside, mm -hmm. and the wobbling goes bigger and bigger and higher and Which higher. Which makes even more temperature because yeah, there's more movement. Yeah. yeah, and that's a big problem of that type of. Or of that um, drive type of polishes. So it's really, if I grab this one, is, is you imagine when there's flex going on in there, all the internal connections between all the cells are rubbing, creating friction, creating heat, and because it's melting from the middle in, you can't see it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I mean, some solutions, some manufacturers have put a hole in the middle of it. Yeah. And um, what was interesting is quite often when we talk about other manufacturers, when we're work working with other manufacturers, they say, well, what about this company? They do that. They're just silent. Well, you know, I don't want to comment on that one. There was immediate, there was a smile uh, from Martin, and, yeah. and they'd actually done some research um, and found that because the hole um, can, uh, and this is reported, this just keep me out of you know, prison, um, the hole um, actually weakens the overall structure of the pad and therefore it becomes essentially more flexible, which creates more movement, which creates more heat, um, which doesn't solve the problem. If anything, it's potentially counterproductive. Yeah. Um, so that's the official flex take on it. Yeah. Um, I'm just saying what he told me. Um, and um, so as a result, these pads, you've, you've tested them, and you don't, I mean, you don't use a, a 21 throw um, no. tw anything. You, you, your maximum throw is? It is uh, 50 millimeters. 50 millimeters. Yeah. Um, and so it's an interesting, different approach. And, and you know, I'm not saying anyone is right or wrong, because I have absolutely no idea on it. <laughs> but we have seen some really cool, and I'll try and steal those photos off you. Um, they've, they've got uh, images, heat-seeking images. You know, like watching police camera action, you always see the crim hiding in the forest in the dark. It's the same principle here. You can see the hot patch in the pad using these special cameras and I love that kind of attention to detail and that research um, but anyway um, I have uh, taken up enough of your time thank oh, okay. you very much for um, answering all our questions and, and also for guiding us around the factory and, and helping out people stupid people like me who, who simply ask silly questions the whole time <laughs> um, it's been an absolute pleasure and uh, what a lovely array of toys you have thank, thank you. you cheers <laughs>